notice in that chant we had just now on the, the four sublime attitudes. You look at the translation, may all beings be happy, may all beings be freed from their suffering, may all beings not be deprived of the good fortune they've attained. It's may, may, may. But then the fourth one is not like that. It's a statement of fact. All living beings are the owners of their actions. When I was in France this last month, I noticed the chanting book that the group there had put together, the French translation of the Sublime Attitudes, and they had missed that point. Their translation of equanimity, <coughs> excuse me, equanimity was, may all beings be the owners of their actions, heirs to their actions. It sounds like a curse. We're not wishing that on anybody. We're simply accepting that's the way things are. We live by our actions. Our actions shape our lives. But it's interesting to note that that reflection on karma is used not only for equanimity, but also to gain a sense of confidence. That there is a way out, and we can do it through our actions. Which means that equanimity is not something to develop on its own. You never see the Buddha recommend equanimity as a single practice. It's always in conjunction with other things. And the purpose is not just to stop at equanimity. This is one of the misunderstandings that comes from looking at the list of the the Four Sublime Attitudes, the Seven Factors for Awakening, even the Ten Perfections all end with equanimity. It sounds like this is where we're going. But that's not the case. You have to develop equanimity in conjunction with those other factors, keeping in mind the principle of karma, that there are certain things that, based on past actions, you can't change. But you have to remember the teaching on karma. Not everything in the present moment is determined by the past. You're making choices in the present as well, and they can make a difference. Remember that argument the Buddha had, or discussion the Buddha had with some Nagantas. It was a sect that existed at his time. They believed that everything in the present moment was shaped by the past, and they endured self-torture to burn off their past karma. And the Buddha asked them, have you ever noticed that this pain you feel during your tortures ends when you stop doing the torture? In other words, the pain is not, the, not coming only from the past, it's coming from things you're doing right now. And so what you're doing right now is something you don't be equanimous about. You have to be equanimous about the fact that there is a pattern for cause and effect. You do certain things and certain results will come. That's something you've got to accept. But then you have the choice as to what kind of things you want to do, what kind of results you're looking for from those actions. Like right now, you're making a choice. You're going to focus on your breath. How you focus on the breath will make a difference for the whole hour. And there may be some pains in the body that come from past actions, past injuries. You work around those. You find that there are areas in the body that are not in pain. You focus there. Think of the breath energy as nourishing those parts of the body, strengthening those parts of the body, and then spreading from there to go through the pains, at the very least to relax some of the tension around the pains. But you have the choice of where you're going to focus your, your attention right now, and what you're going to do with what you're going to find right now. So I think of equanimity in terms of karma. It just doesn't leave you there where you are. It focuses your attention on what you can do. When I was in Paris, there was a point where I was on the sidewalk in front of the hotel waiting for a ride. 
and suddenly realized this is my first time in the country without a translator around. What would I do if someone came up and asked me a question, exposed my awful French? Well, sure enough, there was a telephone lineman working across the street, and he saw me, came across, saying, you're just the person I want to see. I've got a miserable job. I'm surrounded by dishonest people, he said. How can I find happiness in life? How can I find peace in life? So I explained, talked to him about generosity, virtue, meditation. How do you meditate? Well, I gave him the, the website. And the irony was that night I was going to give a talk at a Vipassana Center on the topic of how the present moment is not the goal, how we're not here simply to accept what's happening in the present moment and try to be happy like that. And so I told him the story of the lineman. I mentioned that if I had told him, well, just learn how to be happy or learn how to accept, be equanimous about your miserable job and your dishonest friends, he would have had the good sense to walk away. The Buddha never told us just to sit there and accept things. You accept the way things function in terms of your actions, and then you train the mind to use that principle of cause and effect to create a path. Yeah, equanimity is part of that path, but it's not the whole path, and it's not the goal. Recently I heard of a monk trained in the forest tradition saying that equanimity was the goal, and we're here to arrive at right view, accepting the fact that everything is in constant, arises and passes away, and just be okay with that, which is appalling. The Buddha never taught that. His images for people on the path are ne never images of people who just sit back and accept. They're people who are searching, people who are engaged in a battle, people who are trying to develop skills. And equanimity has a role in developing a skill. It has a role in battles. It has a role in searches. In other words, you look and look and look, and when you don't find something where you think it is, or where it should be. We accept that fact, and then you go look someplace else. If you're in a battle, there are setbacks. You accept the fact that there are setbacks, but you don't let them defeat you. You work your way around them. When you're developing a skill, you use equanimity to look at the results of what you're doing. Watch your actions. Look at the results, and if the results are not satisfactory, you accept that fact, and then you go back and change your actions to be better. So equanimity is selective. Again, like right now, things outside you put aside. Issues in your home, people who, for whom you're responsible, you just put that aside for the time being. Focus on your own mind. But remind yourself you're doing this in a way that doesn't benefit only you. You get your mind under control. You can develop qualities of discernment mindfulness, alertness. Learn how to put aside your greed, aversion, and delusion. The people around you are going to benefit. So part of your motivation for being here it can be that it's going to be better for the people around you. And your equanimity for those people is something that allows you to develop the skill you need right now. So that's one function of equanimity as you develop a skill, is to put anything that's not related to what you're doing right now out of your mind. It's not your business right now. And then, of course, the second function is to look at what you're doing. Are you getting the results you want? If you're not, you can ask yourself, what could I change? Change the spot I focus, change the way I breathe, change the way I conceive of the breath. Learn how to think of the breath as energy. And your feeling of the body, your sense of the body, as you feel from within, is all energy. It's all breath. And as you breathe in, there are no hard spots or solid spots that you have to breathe through. You're simply allowing more energy to come into your energy field. Good energy comes in, bad energy goes out.
There are lots of ways you can change the way you relate to the breath in the present moment, the way you understand the breath in the present moment, what you do with the breath in the present moment. And the equanimity is there to judge the results, to look fairly and objectively at what's going on. So you can be more effective in making changes. So with equanimity we accept the principle of karma that actions have results in line with the quality of the intention, in line with the quality of the action. Then you have to learn the pattern of what works and what doesn't work. But then it leaves open the possibility that you can master that pattern and then use it for the sake of real happiness, because that's what the goal of the practice is. We're not here to arrive at equanimity. We're here to arrive at the ultimate happiness. And equanimity helps get you there as part of the path. But it's not the essence of where we want to go. It's always important that you keep that distinction in mind. so that you can develop the skillful kind of equanimity that helps you, and stay away from the unskillful kinds, the kinds that are lazy or defeatist, or in John Fung's terminology, the small-hearted equanimity that just gets depressed and gives up. Those are not the equanimity, equanimities that the Buddha was teaching. He was teaching large-hearted equanimity in the John Fung's phrase. That has space for the effort that needs to be put into the practice, and the happiness is going to result both along the way and when you arrive at the goal.